Council idea and its realization, also uh, by Ernst Dahlmig. One, council idea, council system, workers' councils, shop councils. Just a year ago, many of you had probably never heard of the, these terms. Their meaning was even less known, but the storm of November 1918 saw workers' and soldiers' councils emerge all over Germany, spontaneously and without any preparation. The revolution created its own expression with elementary force. The council idea does not come from the mind of a particular individual. It can be found in any revolution in which workers lead the struggle for freedom and pursue proletarian and socialist goals. The council organizations that have appeared in history have not been random and superficial organizations. They are the organizations that correspond to a revolutionary situation. Council organizations are strongest where masses of workers fight uncompromisingly for socialism. If one wants to do the council idea justice, one must not forget its revolutionary origins. All attempts to build council organizations within the framework of bourgeois society and on the grounds of capitalist productions will either create distortions or they will not survive. The council idea is inherently progressive. Even with a republican facade, a council organization is a proletarian and socialist means of struggle destined to remove capitalist production and the authority of the state based on capitalist production. The council organization strives for socialist production and self-managed communities. In its purest form, the council idea is nothing other than practical socialism. It creates the conditions needed by the proletariat to realize the teachings of socialist science propagated by the socialist parties. Council organizations have to be formed according to this calling, and the council system will mark the completion of the process. Since the council organization is the child of a revolutionary situation, its formation will never follow a set of bureaucratic rules. Rather, it will take on its exterior form and its tactics according to the demands of a particular revolutionary situation and a particular revolutionary development. At the same time, the council system must follow some general guidelines and always stays true to its main goal, the removal of capitalist production and the implementation of socialist production. The workers' and soldiers' councils that formed during the first days of the revolution were, as already stated, improvised. They remained improvisations for almost a year. Yes, the soldiers' councils disintegrated after a mere six months due to their own incompetence and the political short-sightedness and spinelessness of their leaders. Today, as these lines are written, it will be decided whether the leading sections of the German proletariat have the insight, the will, and the force to build a council system that lives up to its historical calling, or whether the council idea shall be warped in pitiful employees, organizations that carry the council label, in order to consciously deceive the masses. It depends on the outcome of this tension whether the German proletariat will create socialism with courage and purposefulness, or whether it will remain for years, maybe decades, under the yoke of capitalism. The essence of the council idea rests on the following principles. 1. Only the proletariat can carry the council idea, that is, all manual and intellectual workers forced to sell their labor to capital in order to survive. The council idea stands in sharp and natural contrast to the common democratic idea that perceives the citizens as a united mass without regard for the huge contradictions between capital and work and the implied class differences. Two, since the sections of the proletariat championing the council idea are clearly anti-capitalist, they cannot tolerate any capitalist representatives in the council organization. Three, since parliaments within the current formal democratic system are made to serve capitalism as long as the capitalist mode of production exists, the council idea cannot be realized within parliamentarianism. It has to spread from the cells of capitalist production, the workplaces, to the different institutions of the authoritarian state based on capitalist production. Four. Since the realization of the council idea demands the workers' permanent and active participation in all economic and political areas, the bodies of the council system cannot hold any powers long-term, but must be under constant control by the voters who can recall councils or council members whenever they have lost their trust. And five, since the council idea's goal is the liberation of the entire proletariat from capitalist exploitation, the council organization cannot be the domain of a single party or a single profession, but must include the proletariat as a whole. If these principles are neglected, then the council idea will always suffer from shortcomings as a consequence. 
it will likely collapse due to its own deficiencies. In the worst case, it will complicate and prolong the final assault on capitalism for which the proletariat will pay dearly. Section 2. The neglect of the above-mentioned principles during the first phase of the German Revolution was the reason for the complete disintegration of the soldiers' councils and the increasing loss of influence of the workers' councils. I do not want to dwell on the sad story of the soldiers' councils here. The laughing heirs at their grave are the new German mercenaries, callous enemies of the council system, who have repeatedly expressed their hostility in savage ways. However, let us briefly examine the causes that have led to the demise of the workers' councils. During the first days of November, the workers' councils had actual political power. Timid and afraid, the capitalist and ruling classes accepted the improvised system. The workers' councils of Great Britain and its central administrative body, the executive council, appointed the first provisional government, a council of six people's delegates. The reason for handing power to these six men was that there was no revolutionary organization ready to take over the production process and the administration of the state on the grounds of a council system. The highest authority of the fledgling council system at the time, the executive council, only demanded the right to control the activities of the people's delegates. The means of production remained entirely in the hands of the capitalist class. The state apparatus had new men at its head, but remained essentially unchanged. The few dozen men who the revolution had catapulted to the highest positions of state bureaucracy could not transform the state machinery despite their biggest efforts. Furthermore, some of them were far from committed revolutionaries and rather exploited their positions for personal interests. As soon as the capitalist and reactionary circles realized that the revolution remained very superficial, they gathered new courage and, step by step, reestablished their social positions. This took a few months. Only a widespread council system expressing the council ideas, general principles, and well-established at every workplace and state bureau could have prevented the revival of the capitalists and reactionaries. However, the necessary revolutionary organization was missing. This, of course, was no surprise. Germany's proletariat, proletarian masses lack any revolutionary training. The hard lessons of the revolution's deterioration were required to set a process of revolutionary teaching among the proletariat into motion. This process needs to continue dedicatedly, thoroughly, and systematically. A second reason for the failure of establishing a council system in November was that many were impressed by the propaganda for quote-unquote democracy. It was a period of excitement and illusion. German workers did not reflect much on constitutional questions. Only a few understood that, after the demise of the monarchy, Germany only had two options, to become a bourgeois or a proletarian republic. At the same time, this was summarized in the question, national assembly or council system. Unfortunately, the masses overlooked the hypocrisy involving, involved in most calls for democracy. Everyone was now on democracy side, including the biggest enemies of the proletariat and socialism. The people forgot about the situation in the Reichstag and in provisional parliaments before and during the war. They ignored the obvious resistance of the capitalist classes against socialization. As a result, the masses were duped by the Democratic Pied Piper song, and they supported the National Assembly, which essentially was the death sentence for the workers' councils. The defenders of formal democracy and parliamentarianism are perfectly right. The council idea and the council system cannot coexist with democracy in a capitalist world, since democracy in a capitalist world can never amount to anything more than formal political equality. The formal democratic system is embodied in the National Assembly and the Parliamentarian government. Let us look at the first German government elected after the revolution. It consisted of three parties. One is rooted in the Middle Ages and worships the vine and worldly authorities. Another fights for the interests of the financial and industrial capital under the flag of democracy. And the third wants to wave the socialist flag and government by all means. Just like the parliament supporting it, such a government can only be an enemy of the proletarian and socialist workers' councils. The same is true for almost all the provisional parliaments and governments that have been elected in Germany since the revolution and even on the municipal level where workers' councils played the strongest role in the revolution's early stages. Everywhere, the power of the workers' councils had been undermined. 
The conflict was fueled by strike movements that are characteristic of revolutionary periods. They are strongest wherever the proletariat is the driving force of the revolution. The victory of democracy in Germany did not lead to mitigating, but to intensifying class differences. While the beneficiaries of capitalism do everything to maintain capitalist production, the proletariat increasingly sees the only escape from today's hardship in its removal, even if, for the most part, instinctively. The most revolutionary workers were already sternly committed to the council idea during the first months of the revolution, despite all the problems in implementing it. Then, in February and March, the Great Strike movements forced the government to concessions. It promised to enshrine the workers' councils in the Constitution. On the other hand, this proves that the proletariat can enforce changes if it fights with dedication. On the other hand, it proves that these changes will amount to little more than compromises if there is no united workers' front. Only a united proletariat can enforce a radical change of the economic and political system. In the case of the February and March strikes, the government only made the concessions it absolutely had to make given the situation. This reminds us that the force of the entire proletariat is needed to bring about the council idea's final victory. To enshrine workers' councils in the constitution is a curse disguised as a gift, just like a Trojan horse. Making councils elements of a capitalist constitution means to strangulate or at least paralyze any serious implementation of the council idea. A council system under the auspices of the government will inevitably be drawn by the cart of capitalism. The Constitution's council legislation, particularly the shop council laws, confirms this. The council idea will always lose its essence when linked to the parliamentarian system. A further reason for the disintegration of the council system during the revolution was that the workers' councils, with few exceptions, were not formed by the proletarian masses or at the heart of the proletarian revolution, namely at the workplace. Instead, they largely relied on party affiliation. In many cases, the members of the workers' councils were simply appointed by the leadership of the two social democratic parties without even consulting the rank and file. The original principle of appointing an equal number of SPD and USPD members in each council was increasingly lost because reformist socialism and revolutionary socialism cannot go together. Only in a few regions do the councils actually manage the production process. The power of the so-called, quote, communal workers' councils, unquote, usually hardly exceeds the right to monitor local authorities and a few state offices. Nonetheless, the state bureaucrats try constantly to shut them down by ministerial decrees, municipal enactments, etc., always citing democratic rights. In most places, the parties don't consider the councils important. With proletarian mass support lacking at the same time, many of them simply disappear or are marginalized to the point of complete insignificance. They only remain in areas where capitalism and the state find a proletarian facade useful, for example, when illegal trade or housing shortage needs to be covered up. A problem for many communal workers' councils is also the conflict between, quote, party discipline, unquote, and, quote, proletarian duty, unquote. It leads many social democrats to embrace their role as council members only half-heartedly. Many council members actively undermine the power of the councils because their party leaders are hostile to the council idea, which they have to be for reasons of self-preservation alone. When communal workers' councils survive, they are hardly ever controlled by the proletariat and not even by the party's rank and file. As a result, the principle of recalling delegates has become meaningless and a kind of quote-unquote council bureaucracy has formed, at times even a quote-unquote council corruption. All this means that all the current forms of the council system have to be eradicated shall the council idea remain alive and eventually be victorious. We need a council system that truly reflects all of the council idea's demands. Section 3. I have already stated that the duty of the revolutionary council system consists of turning the theory of socialism into praxis. Socialist theory as well as the experience of social struggle tells us that this can only be achieved by the proletariat. This also means that the council system is closely related to the dictatorship of the proletariat. The phrase has always threatened the bourgeoisie. Lately, however, even the reform socialists portray the dictatorship of the proletariat as the ultimate evil. Recent developments in Russia, Hungary, Munich, etc. seem to justify this. 
a dictatorship that is not built on the proletarian masses, only on a proletarian minority, and only able to defend its power by military means is destined to fail. A dictatorship, however, in which millions of class-conscious proletarians strive for the realization of socialism is not dependent on military means, violence, and terrorist acts. It can rely on the proletarian masses and their power. Of course, things will never go entirely smoothly, and there will be confronta confrontations with the enemy that makes the use of weapons necessary and might impose civil war upon the workers. The first task of the council system is to prepare the dictatorship of the proletariat by establishing the necessary organizational structures. Then political power has to be seized. Finally, the dictatorship of the proletariat has to take control of the production process and the state apparatus. In practical terms, this means that the establishment of the dictatorship of the proletariat must imply a thorough expropriation of the capitalist class whose private ownership of the means of production must be replaced by common ownership. It is important, however, that the production process is not interrupted. This can never be in the interest of the people. The council system must carefully prepare the continuation of production under socialism. At the same time, it must focus on more than just the economy. It lies in the nature of the revolution that the council system has strong political implications and that it will be involved in many struggles on that plane, directly or indirectly. On the basis of these insights, we now have a vanguard of class-conscious revolutionary proletarians pursuing a council system that shall first be established in the production process. The first steps toward this end have caused an outcry among capitalist, bureaucratic, and military circles. The rulers have a fine sense for class conflict and instantly recognize any danger to their possessions and their power. For us, however, their reaction only confirms that we are on the right way. The quote-unquote council system favored by the government does not even deserve its name. The council organization that the government is willing to tolerate completely disregard the revolutionary nature of the council idea and make a travesty of its proletarian and socialist origins. At the core of the government's council system stands the so-called shop council law, in which the councils play no role whatsoever in the production process, let alone work towards the abolition of capitalist production. Rather, the council shall quote-unquote prevent trouble in the workplace and help the capitalists achieve the quote-unquote company's ambitions. The company's ambitions are, of course, nothing but profit, dividends, shares, etc., all aspects of the council system that the government wants to build on the basis of the shop council law are full of wormholes. For example, district economy councils shall be implemented in which shop and council members will discuss socialization with the shrewd representatives of the property class. The councils are also allowed to quote-unquote present ideas to the authorities, employers, associations, etc., I believe that it, it is evident that such a council system does not remove but firmly secure capitalist production. The quote-unquote council system label is used to dupe the proletariat into serving the interests of its capitalist class enemy. In the revolutionary council system, there is no room for the property class. The revolutionary council system builds on the workplace, the core of the production process. In the workplace, all proletarians, no matter their party affiliation, stand on common ground. They are all exploited by capital and the contradictions between proletarian and capitalist interests are obvious. Their class-conscious workers familiar with socialist ideas have recognized this contradiction most clearly. Therefore, they form the first line in the struggle for the revolutionary council system. However, their influence on the indifferent and politically uneducated workers must become much stronger. All workers have to understand that the council system is the only means to escape capitalism. There must be tireless agitation since it is essential for the council system that the workers' political participation is not limited to casting a vote. The workers must always examine the action of the councils. This demands constant intellectual awareness. Only then can the council idea serve as an effective means against the herd tendencies within the proletariat. At this point, I do not want to write about the organizational details of the revolutionary council system. There are enough opportunities to discuss the proper council organization at the workplace. However, I want to address one more thing. The task of the council system sketched above imply that the council system is not only relevant for the manual workers, but also for the intellectual worker. The monitoring and control of capitalist production 
of the transformation to the socialist production and require numerous skills, including those of engineers, technicians, accountants, scientists, and others. Therefore, these people must have a place in the council system. In relation to capital, the majority of intellectual workers are nothing but proletarians. They too have to sell their labor in order to survive. The division between manual and intellectual labor is nothing but a particularly clever maneuver by the property class. The council system, however, can build the necessary bridges uniting all proletarians. In the end, we will finally realize what LaSalle meant by the union of science and labor. So much about the council idea and its implementation, I've not spoken the last word on this question, and there won't be a last word anytime soon. The ups and downs of the social revolution that shakes all of the world's countries, the council idea, will constantly find new expressions. Meanwhile, the individual worker who has understood the power of the idea can prepare the realization of socialism, and therefore of a higher human culture, at the very place life has put him in.